All right, so I'm going to keep repeating myself, but clearly we don't have this shelter in place issue figured out. So I am live here, and hopefully, some of you find this. Uh, I'm going to wait in here. It's 8 19 now. So we are some 20 odd minutes late from what we were going to do. And again, we've had about two weeks to try and figure this out and haven't been able to. So um, haven't been able to get it to where we want it. So I am committing to the next 45 minutes or so, hour or so, for whoever we can get in here to go ahead and ask me questions. I'm going to actually try to call people and see if I can get them on here. You won't be able to see them, but maybe you'll be able to hear them. And you guys, we have a live chat going. Let's see if I can see you guys in here. I can't see you guys in here, so I'm going to have to figure out how to see you guys and answer questions. Uh, let's see, learn more. This is something I'm going to learn as we go along. But I'm going to try and get people just talking to me. Let's see, I'm going to throw something in here, test. Tell me if you guys that are in here see that or can comment on that. Because I can see that I'm writing something to you guys, but I can't see if anyone. There we go. Hey, Justin, Bill, good. All right. So, again, we were going to do a full show like we always do. I'm here in my home office. Um, I'm actually going to, going to call Scott Bauer on his cell phone because he was my next guest, or my first guest, I should say. And uh, you guys tell me if you can hear him okay. All right. I told him that I was going to give him a ring, but I got to find his number. Let's see if I can get him on speakerphone here. You guys can hear me okay. Hey, Scott. Hey, Scott. I'm actually live myself on YouTube, and I put you on the phone here. Can I just want to see if people can hear you okay. I know you got a time limit, so... Can you guys tell me if you can hear Scott? Hey, everybody. Good morning. Let's see what kind of comments I get here. Justin said yes to that. Come on, guys. Let's get some fingers typing. Can you guys hear Scott? Okay. Yeah. Come on, everybody. Let's go. <laughs> We're going to make the best. Yeah, we can hear him. So, Scott, I know you're on, you're on time limit. So we've got about six minutes left with you. So if you can just give me uh, just a couple minutes of what you're thinking. By the way, Scott, president of Prosper Trading. You guys can reach out to him. Uh, ProsperTrading.com, Scott? You got it. All right. So just give, me, can I, just give me kind of four minutes, three minutes. I'll just let you go what you're thinking. Everybody can look at my ugly mug while we're doing that. <laughs> I'm glad they're looking at you and not me, buddy. <laughs> Well, what am I thinking here? I, I, I'm thinking that we uh, have a leg lower. I'm not saying that we're going to retrace the, the absolute lows. Um, it just doesn't make sense, the recovery that we've had so quickly in just a basically a straight line up. Um, so I, I would look for some sort of retracement here. Again, not necessarily back to the lows that we've had. And if we get it and if we see any sort of vol. But, and I'm not talking about the VIX being back to 70 or 80, but I'm saying the VIX being back to the upper 40s or 50, it is a volatility at that point, in my opinion, would be a massive sale. So are you looking to sell volatile now or you're waiting for that spike? Yeah, I'm kind of indifferent right here. I, 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 I think that if we get a little bit of a sell-off in the market and we see vol pop, I'd be all over selling volatility at that point. Right, right. Okay. So let me ask you just a quick question. Again, I know you're on a little bit of a time limit. I apologize for this. Uh, I'm okay. hoping I'm hoping that we don't have this issue. I'm hoping I can get back in the studio um, for our May show. By the way, I believe that's May 16th, I think. Um, don't quote me on that, guys. We'll correct that. You guys log in emails and notifications. But from a perspective of um, what the market is doing right now, I have data that shows that the last two bear markets didn't reach their low. Okay, so in other words, from the entry of the bear market to the low price of the bear market, I'm just averaging two of them together. It's basically 30 months and 14 months, right? So right around the 23, 24 month mark. 
Um, without yeah. without anyone holding Scott to this, because I don't think that's fair. Do you think we make another leg lower to a new low, or are you just looking for opportunities in terms of pressure that maybe hasn't kind of squeezed itself out yet? Yeah, I'm looking for opportunity. Um, and, and the reason being, Bob, is you know the, the market trades so psychologically, and and the reason that we saw VIX in the 70s and even eclipsing 80s and then the massive sell-off that we saw was all due to uncertainty, right? This was all new. A couple of weeks ago, this virus was all new. The quarantines were all new. The social distancing was all new. People don't like uncertainty. Right. That's why we saw that massive spike up in VIX and, and most, I don't want to say most of the sell-off, but a good portion of the sell-off. Now that some of that unknown is out of the marketplace, okay? Fundamentals are going to take over a little bit, and fundamentals still are not great, which is why I believe we are going to take a leg lower, but not to the level that we saw. Right. All right, well, great. I'm going to let you go, but the last thing I just wanted to ask you, um, just from a perspective of um, the markets in general, do you think the market is currently pricing in the economic damage we're going to have? No, I don't. Okay. That, that I don't. And, and I think there's going to be, you know, a price to pay for that. Okay, cool. Scotty, again, and, uh, I'm, yeah. sorry, I'm sorry about the mix-up. I'm going to let you go because I know you're out of time crunch here. Uh, we'll try and get you back for the May show if your schedule allows so people can see your pretty face instead of mine. Thank you, Bob. Have a great day. <laughs> All right. Cheers, Scotty. So I appreciate that. Justin, your question on whether or not we're recording this, I believe we are. Okay. I believe we are. Rec I think the YouTube live automatically records this. So um, let me just ask my team here if anyone was able to reach Shri because Shri was, I was really excited about having Shri on the show and he's got some really good uh, commentary to make. And I might have the same situation from a perspective of whether or not um, I can get Shri on for an extended period of, period of time, okay? So let me just, I'm going to go ahead and give Shri a ring. Do not leave. Uh, I don't know if I can mute you guys. Can I mute you guys? Uh, Shri, is, Shri is very much like me. He's not technologically savvy. So I'm going to go ahead and try and ring him. That was a mute, right? You saw my lips move and you didn't see me uh, talking. Is that correct? I'm going to go ahead and try and get Shri on the line because he's just such a bright, bright guy. And if I can't get a few minutes with him, um, Shri is waiting. Okay, great. I'm just going to go ahead and call him then. I want to see if I can get Shri on the phone. Just confirming again, you guys can hear me right now. My team said, Justin, you're the best. Hello. Is it Shri? Hello. Shri. It is. Who's it? Bob? This is Bob Itino. How are you? Okay, I don't think I can. Actually, I can talk to you guys on Skype. Let me go to you guys on Skype. I'll come right back. Okay, all right. All right, I'm going to talk to these guys on Skype. No, I think the phone is going to be better. They said they're connected on Skype, on Zoom. Let me do this. I'm going to go into the Zoom room here. So just so you guys know, Zoom was kind of our problem. Zoom and YouTube don't necessarily have the same video settings. And I know there's a workaround. Um, yeah, I know there's a workaround for it, but I don't really know what that workaround is. So I'm going to find out if for, if, if for some reason we are in quarantine when our May show comes along. Can you guys confirm when the May show is? Because I don't have it in front of me. Um, let's see. The May, the, the May show is going to be, I think it's May 16th. I believe it's May 16th. All right, let me try and find Zoom here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch my screen to Zoom. You guys are seeing me playing my email right now. Nope, I can't do that either. Okay, so I have to do it here. All right, cool. May 18th. It is May 18th is the show. So all right, hang on one second. I'm going to be talking to both Serge Berger, who is the head head trader and chief investment strategist at um, 
trade steady. I'm sorry, the steady trader. There we go. And then Kamal Shri Kumar, who I need to tell you is not a registered representative and he does not give trading advice. Okay. Hey guys, if you can, just shoot me that Zoom invite again really quick. Because I'm struggling to find it. Just email me that Zoom invite really quick so I can log into it. In the meantime, we're talking about a Dow that's looking down on the future side about 106. So that puts the S&P down around 10 or 11 uh, a few minutes before the open here. Here we go. I got it. I think I got it. Got it, got it, got it. Join a meeting. Well, oh, that's a different one. What is amazing, you know, I always talk about um, how it's pretty cool that technology allows us to talk to each other like this. The technology also puts me in a position where I'm filling time while I try and get these guys on the line for you. So the same technology that allows me to talk to you guys allows me to do this kind of a show, screws me up. All right, here's the link to Zoom, got it. Yeah, Justin, thanks for all the help, by the way. The team is definitely communicating with me, but I'm like looking at a couple of different things at the same time. All right, please wait. The meeting host will let me in. As soon as I'm in this meeting, I'm going to jump right to uh, Shri. You guys let me in? Please wait. The meeting host will let you in. So... Let me talk to you a little bit about Shri for a second while I wait to get in here. Uh, Kumal Shri Kumar, who goes by Shri, is, uh, as I mentioned in the invite video, probably the best macro e economist I've ever seen. Um, and I've been doing this about 26, going on 27 years. interviews with Shri, and he has not been wrong, uh, literally not been wrong at all. And you'll see Twitter exchanges between him and me talking about, uh, with me complimenting him, on the calls that he's made. So, reduction, if you can hear me, let me in the Zoom meeting room so I can talk to these guys. I'm still waiting to be let in. I know, right, Justin? <laughs> let me in. There we go. I'm connecting now. There's Surge. I can see Surge. Hey, Bob. And there's Shri. How are you guys? Hey, man. How are you doing, Bob? Good. I'm going to prop you guys up on my little, uh, little stand that I've got here. So you guys can now see me. Can the people in the live room hear you right now? Can you guys hear Shri as he's speaking? Shri, can you say hello? Hello. Otherwise, I'll turn the volume up a little bit. Just let me know if you guys can hear them. Yes, they can hear you, Shri. So we had some technical difficulties, but I didn't want to miss the opportunity to get you and Sir John. So, Shri, let me just talk with you so I can let you go because you're a little more important than my technology problems uh, dictate. I've already told everyone, uh, Kumal Shri Kumar Global, he's not an investment advisor. He does not give investment advice. He doesn't give trading advice. He talks about markets from a macroeconomic perspective, top down. Okay, so there is no assumption of trade um, ideas here. There's no assumption of trade recommendations. So keep that in mind. But I just want to talk about, Shri, I've already told the audience um, how right you've been. Okay, I mean, I, you know I talk about this. If you guys go back and look at my Twitter feed, you can see how often I've complimented you on being right. And now they're starting to compliment you on the financial news media. So. I hope that has the desired effect of you taking your time to be on shows like that and like this. But you think the 10 year is headed towards zero, right? Can you kind of talk about that a little bit? And can, you, can you answer if that's being caused by the Fed or that's in spite of what the Fed is doing? 
Bob, those are great questions. I think the 10 year yield, what happens to it? I've always maintained is irrespective of the Fed. While a, an initiation of a quantitative easing or a quantitative tightening can always influence the 10 year bond yield in the short term. In the overall, when the short-term impact is removed, the 10-year yield responds to two fundamental factors. What is your expected real rate of return that you hope to get from holding treasuries? That is proxy by the real rate of growth of the economy, or GDP growth. Second, what are your inflationary expectations? If you expect a high inflation in the future, then you want a higher nominal yield and I, who is willing to lend to you, I am also willing to pay you a higher nominal yield because with the cash that you give me, I can get a higher nominal return. Very simple. And over the last four years, I have maintained that the economic growth is not going to pick up and jump ahead. It hasn't. And also that inflation is not going to get out of hand, as some people have feared time and time again. So that's the reason for saying that the 10-year yield will go down when the consensus thought it was going to go up. Now, um, again, Bob, as you're asking, what next? You are going to have a very severe recession, which I don't think is factored into financial markets mm -hmm. yet. So once that is done, the 10-year yield keeps going down. We had a uh, March 9th, we had a low intraday low of about 31 basis points. I think we are going to break that and go lower. And inflation is not going to break out, not in 2020. 2021 may be a different question, but this year is a low inflation year. So you kind of answered my question, and maybe I can throw a quick curveball at you. When you talk about 10-year yields going even lower, and that's obviously, we'll call that the medium term. Is that fair to say that it's going to be over the medium, short to medium term? Or you're not saying long term because we're still questioning 2021, and I consider that to be two years out. So from a perspective of the equity markets, are we going to end up in a situation when we quote unquote get back to normal, which nobody really knows what that looks like, that money is still going to be forced into equities because dividend yields are going to be higher? Or would you say that the dividend yields are going to suffer and it's just not a good enough case? I think dividend yields are going to suffer. So equity prices are going to suffer along with the economy, Bob. But here's the issue. Last week, we found that non-investment grade uh, bonds were something the Fed purchased. Right. What if you find out that the S&P 500 temporarily goes down to the 2000 level and the Fed jumps in and decides it's going to buy the S&P 500? Wow, so I can't. I mean, I can your analysis is out of the window. Yeah, that blows my mind. I mean, if the government is buying actual stocks, what what are we doing here? Essentially, we have the United Soviet States of the Federal Reserve. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. Since it becomes very difficult. So going back to your question on the 10-year, I think if, whether equities go down or not, if to the extent the Federal Reserve is going to flood the place with money and the, uh, and the growth doesn't pick up and inflation remains low, that pushes the yield down nevertheless. So in other words, Irrespective of what the Fed does, I think you're going to have the yield going down. So let me kind of combine two questions because we got started late and I don't want to keep you any longer. And hopefully I can get you back on on a future show for an actual fair amount. But can you talk about how early we are in the data cycle? And then you had some examples of Argentina, Haiti and Zimbabwe that I'd love for you to just kind of get into and take the rest of your time. Let me let me take your first question first, Bob. I think we are very early in the in the data cycle. I think Wednesday we'll find out what happened to retail sales in the month of March. In February we were down only 0.5 percent, but then March, according to a Bloomberg survey, is showing a negative 8 percent month on month. So April, May could be even worse. So you're talking about the relatively early in the data cycle. And which is also why I think the markets haven't discounted it. And second, as you look forward in terms of what, it, what is happening, the stimulus that we are applying, when you add the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve, right. my calculation adds up to about 
of the US GDP of $22 trillion. Wow. Approximately $11 trillion, $12 trillion of stimulus. Assuming that the payroll protection plan actually works and you actually feed the money into the economy. If you do, then you're adding about 50% stimulus. That's why I say fast forward to 2021, 2022. Right. The countries, Argentina, that I mentioned, is a country where essentially they increase money supply and look upon it as a panacea. We are doing the same. I don't believe that just because the US dollar is a global reserve currency, we have the ability to abuse that privilege. That privilege comes with certain conditions. And if you abuse it, you gradually lose it. And that's why I'm very concerned about a pickup in inflation, pickup in bond yields, say roughly speaking, one year from now. Okay, one year, perfect. So are we in a permanent interventionist world? Is that it? Or is that too broad of a question? It's not, it's a good question. I think we are currently in an interventionist world and come 2021, my fear is the intervention will not be taken off mm -hmm. because it's easy to feed the stimulus, much more difficult to take it off. Right. And so I think the financial markets are still going to suffer the impact of it as you look into the new year. Shree, I'm sorry about the technical problems. Thank you so much for being with us. I really, really appreciate it. You, you are a hero, Bob. You have <laughs> done this with all the problems. Thank you for having me on. Very much appreciated, Shree. I'm going to hurry up and go to Serge Berger. Serge, if you can hear me, Go ahead and unmute yourself, or maybe the host has to unmute you, so I can. Hey, how are you, Serge? Again, I'm apologizing to all the guests and to all the viewers for the technical problems. Justin, I see your comment there, and clearly, uh, Shri agrees with you that they're going to continue to prop up the economy, buy everything, as he. Great. I'm going to use this line next time I'm on television myself. Uh, I'll email Shri and see if he'll give me the permission to use this. The United States of the Soviet Reserve. I love that. I really love that line. Serge, talk about your view overall, because again, I'm, I'm having to constrict the show, unfortunately. And I know that you uh, had a semiconductor trade that you were looking at from an ETF perspective. So just kind of give me who you are, where people can find you, because I want to get that out there. And then talk about your view on the market and the semiconductor situation that you're looking at. Yeah, hey, Bob, I uh, appreciate you putting this together. Uh, would certainly echo Shree's comments. Uh, I know these technical things, uh, it's always a challenge. Um, I am the uh, head trader and uh, chief investment uh, uh, strategist at studytrader.com, uh, which is uh, research uh, and more tactical ideas. And we also have a registered investment advisory company, uh, which is a more of advisors. Um, I will say that I very much agree with what Shree just said. Uh, it's been one of our big calls. Uh, for the past, uh, I'd say at this point, but probably 12 months, not quite, uh, that we thought interest rates would go a lot lower. Um, there is a couple other things that I would, uh, that, that I would, at least from my perspective, add on that commentary on the 10 year. There's also, you know, we also have demographical challenges, um, which I think are, are you know, are, 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 are a good part or an additional part of, of the, the tailwind to, to, to lower yields, um, which I think it cannot be underestimated. So basically a lot of people, you know, retiring, peak retirement, and then a lot of people are de-risking. So there's that additional element to that as well. So you're talking um, about, so the, the later half of boomers coming out of the markets as well, uh, is one of the things that's going to continue to add a little bit of, so I always talk about equity markets having a natural upward bias simply because of the money going in. You're thinking that dynamic could not go away, but maybe shift a little bit. Yes, I think so. I think there's just a natural de-risking. If you look at this, from a, I'm a big demographics freak. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things. So you're a data guy, guys. right? I mean, you're, you're sort of an amateur slash professional data guy. <laughs> Morgan, and then you have a certain way of looking at things when you look at it through the institutional lens. They want more data and backup than, than, than the retail crowd. Um, but uh, no, but I think that's part of the reason. So I think I think the equity market highs, and it's always difficult to kind of navel gaze at just the SP. If I find there's a lot of sort of um, you know structural problems with, with that index in, in, in the sense of being overweight, and, you know, with, with just a few stocks and the whole ETF passive investing bubble that I think we're in. Um, 
But uh, but yeah, I think equity markets basically are capped. I think for a lot longer than people think, and 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 I think bonds will continue to get at least to some extent a natural bid uh, again because of the demographical uh, tailwinds. So I'll throw the question I had I threw at uh, Scott Bauer earlier before you came on. Um, do you think that the lows are in and we're just going to have pressure? Or do you think there's going to be another low at some point? I mean, as Shri said, we're obviously early in the economic data cycle, right? I mean, we don't know anywhere, like by any stretch of the imagination, what the data is going to look like once we reopen. We obviously know it's going to be bad currently. So we're early in the economic data cycle. Do you think there's potentially another low coming? Or do you just think it's going to stay under pressure for a while? My gut instinct is to think that we have a plenty, potentially a lot lower to go. I, I assign about a 30% chance of seeing something between 1,500 and 1,800 in the S&P. Um, again, I say 30% chance, and I think my, my concern is very much what, what, what Sri addressed earlier is what the Fed is doing. You know, so whether it's 3,000, I don't know if there's an absolute level sure. that they're looking at. I, I don't think there's an absolute level, but there is that risk that they somehow try to find a way to, to put a bit in the equity markets. It's, again, it's not my base case, but if that happens, and the Fed is basically telling us that any prudent investing is basically out the window at this point. So if you're shorting high yield because you're seeing a real problem in credit risk, and I'm a credit markets guy, um, credit markets haven't gotten any better in the broader sense. You know, and if you look at the stuff that they're buying, it or said they're buying, it, it's stuff that's going into, trip, into non-investment grade, not stuff that's already been in there, and that's really kind of like where a lot of the stuff already is. So, but I think that's that is honestly a real problem. I just had calls with a couple of, of our institutional funds this morning, and you know the Fed can do a lot of stuff to 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 stem a, a further drop, but I don't think they can necessarily do, keep the economy from getting worse. I think that's there's a there's a difference there. So let's talk about your trade. What we try to do on this show is actually I try to get trade opinions and ideas from the guests. And if I like them, I put them on. And apologies to my sponsors who are E-Trade and the CME Group, uh, which, by the way, if you haven't tried Power E-Trade, you should, so I can keep doing this show. And from a perspective of your trade itself, normally I want to put them on. I can't, right? So, and actually, you gave me a little heads up, and, and I didn't hate that trade. So let's give you an opportunity to kind of talk about what you were looking at. Well, so what I was looking at is, is looking at the SMH ETF, which represents semiconductor stocks. Now, right. that's an, it's an important part of the, of the economy. You know, technology is a lot of, a lot of reasons why that's important. Um, and what I'm thinking at the very, as a very base case right now is, is I do think equities are probably getting a bit top heavier, at least for a trade. Now, I'm a big correlation guy. And if you look at the correlation, so we have our internal tools that tracks correlation between um, between different asset classes, so the correlation, or, or even between equity market sectors, the correlation between most sectors in the S&P is somewhere north of 85 to 90 percent. Meaning that if you buy any single stock in the S&P, it's most likely going to do what the broader market does. Right. So to me, the SMH trade is really nothing more than just you know a ref, a basically trying to maybe get a bit of leverage on the broader market, thinking that broader stock market is going to go down a little bit at least for for, for right now here. So what do you want to do in the SMH? Well, I think more specifically, again, we have to talk about areas of where you want to potentially do this trade in because we're sure we still have a, a lot of volatility. But I think you can go short the SMH anywhere between, you know, it's right now currently around 123 and change to maybe, you know, 128 and change is kind of a range. So 123, 120. I know it's a big range, but we have a lot of volatility. So that's yeah. sort of your entry range. And I'm looking at a first downside target at 115 and then potentially 110. Um, if you go above 132, I think you have to stop yourself out and you can always try it again. But a lot of these trends, and this is going back to also what you just spoke to the street about, you know, a lot of these trends are we're getting a lot more data that's just coming up, going to start coming up this week. We don't even know what's going on with the economy yet. Yeah, no one has we don't. Any read through. We don't. And one of the things I talked about, Serge, a couple of weeks ago on TV was we had 3.3 million jobless, then we had 6.6, .6, then we had 6.6. .6. Does anyone believe that it's exactly 6.6 .6 each week, or is that all they can process? You know, I mean, is that sort of the maximum that they have the ability to process right now? And so it's going to be 6.6 .6 again until it starts to go down, is, is my idea. No, I agree. And look, I think, I think 
think this is one of those situations, you know, and you know this as being a great trader yourself, it's all about, you know, understanding when to do a trade and when, when to step away. And I think this is one of those situations where you need to kind of just let things settle. I still think there's way too much stuff going on to really make any high conviction things. You know, it, it, it really, even on the long side, if you want to buy, you know, some of the things that I was just have a list of stocks that are like long term, like JP Morgan, you know, I can't imagine a world about JP Morgan given everything has gone through right the <laughs> famous last words right but even there i'm not quite sure that needs to be bought right here right now we need to see what happens say they have good read through once things settle down but it's still we're locked down i mean yeah. you can't, how are you going to read through a lockdown you know? right right and by the way i've, I've known surge and, and those wide ranges are based on volatility not based on trying to give himself some room for that trade to work. When volatility is up like this, the key is shrinking your position size and playing the same type of ranges that your price action models and your fundamental models otherwise would tell you. You just shrink your position size to maintain consistent risk. Serge, I'm gonna give you the last word and then I wanna give Jimmy Iurio his time. Um, if I can let my team know that they can go ahead and unmute Jimmy as soon as you're done talking. Tell people again where they can reach you and say it loud because I've got you again on my FaceTime over here. You can't see me. I'm over here, buddy. But uh, so, but they can hear your voice, but it's kind of faint because of the way that I rigged this. I got you. No, I'm at the, you can go to the steadytrader.com. So it's www.thestudytrader.com. Uh, that is our, um, our website for the uh, advisory and newsletters. And what about Twitter if someone wants to get to you directly? Yeah, my, my, my Twitter handle and, and YouTube handle, uh, which might be even more pertinent, is, is Steady Trader, S T A D Y Trader. Uh, we post stuff there all day long. So. so Steady Trader, not the Steady Trader. Yeah, the handle is Steady Trader. The website is the Steady Trader. Yeah. All right, cool. YouTube is probably your best, your best uh, that, that we do a lot of stuff on there. So. so Steady Trader channel on YouTube. Um, or Twitter. The, or Twitter, thesteadytrader.com. Serge, I appreciate it. Apologize again for technical difficulties. If you're willing, we'd like to get you back soon. Be happy to be on. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. All right, guys, I want you guys to do this. Uh, the, the last segment of the show is going to be me and Mike Arnold, and I want you guys to start loading up questions, but I want to go to Jimmy Iorio. Jimmy, are you aware of the uh, technical problems that I'm having? I, I am now, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not able to get your pretty face up here. Although people, if they've watched CNBC, they've seen us standing next to each other on CNBC a year or two back um, when we used to do the Futures Now show together. So I do like to point out that I'm approximately one eighth of an inch taller than you. So I always yeah, like to point I out. That. I think your dad is wrong. That's your model, <laughs> garbage in, garbage out. Right? <laughs> So Jimmy and I obviously are friends. Jimmy's a managing director at TJM Institutional Services. He's also a CNBC contributor. I've known Jimmy for about 25 years. I think I just cussed, but I can because we're not on TV. So about 25 years I've known him. Um, he gives me market advice, and I try to give him fashion advice that he doesn't take. So Jimmy, we, you, uh, I gave you sort of a feel. Uh, you're very good in equities, and you're one of my go-to interest rate guys. So uh, let me just give you a second to kind of, and again, I want to tell people still watching, start loading the chat up with question because Justin was kind enough to tell me that there's a little delay in the chat. But Jimmy, let me give you a few minutes to talk about what you see going on here and the way you would or are taking advantage of it as an example. Well, the, the fight began two months ago, and it was always going to be the same thing. On one hand, you had the economic ramifications of this, which are, you know, stark and dire obviously but on the other hand was the counterbalance of the fed that was going to get involved and was going to get involved heavily now there's a third element to it as well and that the other world central banks are throwing money at this problem too so if you are going to be a quasi bull which i'm kind of a little bit of a quasi bull and i'll explain that a little later you have to believe a couple things you have to believe that we are pricing in something that's going to be bad no matter what, but hopefully we're pricing in the right amount of badness or overshooting a little bit. And you have to make the assumption too, that when the dust begins to settle, wherever that, wherever that may be, that the world's money, not just the Fed's money, is going to start to trickle in to U.S. assets, particularly equities. So, so to me, I'm, to call myself bullish is, it is definitely an overstatement, yeah. but to participate from the long side and to do it to mitigate risk. And again, I, I don't, I don't give recommendations. I, I have right. clients who I know what their risk parameters are and I know how to trade my own money. 
So you'll see when, when we talk about it, how I'm going to dip my toe in the water. Um, you can't just go out and buy vol because volatility is still ridiculously high. So to express yourself, in my mind, I wanted to buy and sell. Yeah. So again, I want to point out that Jimmy is an institutional uh, manager at TJM. He's a director. Uh, he is not out here telling you guys what to do. He's not a registered investment advisor for individuals, but he has a show called Market Movers that he does for the CME group that you should check out where um, you used to give trade examples, kind of general guidelines as to how to use futures. So I want to throw a question at you, Jimmy, before you go into what you're looking at, because Gene had a really good question. Uh, there's an old saying that we've known for years, don't fight the Fed. And Gene wants to know what does fighting the Fed look like in this market? Well, in the, in the classical form, it would be you know, the Fed, and they announced last week that not only are they going to be buying what they've been buying before, they're going to buy munis, they're going to buy corporates, they're just they're pretty much buying everything. And again, if, if you want to say, oh, well, the Fed doesn't buy stacks, well, you know, they're buying corporate bonds and they're buying right. I mean, To me, it's just a different without a difference without distinct, a distinction without difference or whatever that expression is. So to not fight the Fed in this classical sort of uh, way to look at it would be to not be short things that they are buying. And that, in my mind, would include stocks tangentially. Um, again, I'm not saying that that's the right axiom to be, to be um, uh, you know, looking at right now, just because we're in a, we're in a really different world. Deep down, I think it, it might it might be. I just don't think it's as easy as normal it is. All right. So what are you looking at? Uh, we, we talked for, God, for a long time about CME Group Futures products, and I like trading the micros, but you have a potential couple of option ideas that you wanted to talk about in CME products. Sure. I, I quite a bit, I, I trade the, the uh, options on the ES, and then I, I use those micros to hedge different you know, deltas when, when things start to move a little bit. But I, I put in a trade this morning that I, I liked a bit ago, and I like a little bit less now. <laughs> so I, look, I trade a lot of call flies and put flies. Okay, so this is a put fly. I'm looking at, I mean, a call fly, and I'm looking at it for this Friday. It's not a standard call fly. It's a broken call fly. I'll explain what that means. It's not very complicated at all. So for this Friday, I bought the 2820 call and sold the 2880 call. So that so I'm buying that at 60 wide call spread is the first part of this. And then I'm selling the 2880, 2930 call spread, which is a up. Uh, uh, that's a 50 tick wide call spread. So I'm buying a, like, but we, we're Italian, we talk with our hands. Yeah. I'm buying a 60 tick wide call spread and I'm selling a 50 tick wide call spread. So that just so everybody understands, Jimmy, that's the broken part of it, right? Because you're not doing consecutive strikes. Right. Cause they're, so they're, the, the wings are not equal. So everything's equal. And the reason I do that is because even if the market then shoots higher, and I pay 10 and a half ticks for it, even if the market shoots higher, um, it's still going to be worth 10 ticks. Your max risk on this, if the market goes lower, doesn't go up near that uh, first strike, is you lose the 10 and a half ticks you paid. But if you are, one thing I really genuinely hate is to be right and have the direction correct and it fly through it on a fly and then not make anything because it went beyond that second call spread that you sold. So that's why I, some, I stagger them and go 60 50 because 60 minus 50, if it blows up through the top side, the least it can be worth is 10 ticks. I've had decent luck with these before. I did it this morning earlier, and the market's traded off since then. But, I, you know, I mean, again, it has till Friday. In this market, you can do 100 ticks in about a state. Yeah, we both know it's not luck. You're actually skilled at this stuff. So from a perspective of this, so you're buying a call spread, you're selling a call spread. It's not consecutive legs on the spreads, That hence the name broken call fly. And um, Jimmy, where can people reach you and again, I'm sorry about the shortened time. I'm supposed to have another five minutes for you. But uh, I want to give a little bit of time to Mike Arnold here at the end. And hopefully I can get him up soon. But from a perspective of um, this particular trade, it's a protected bearish trade. I'm sorry, bullish trade. Yes. It, 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 deep down, I, you know, I've been doing this a long time and I've been trading a long, long time. I believe mitigating risk is more important than anything else. Mm -hmm. I think that an expressive view, and if you define your risk, and that's why I tend to use um, the CME options products to do that, because you can define your risk on this. Even when you trade the futures, sometimes you put in a stop, and sometimes it slips through that uh, stop in an illiquid market, and we've seen some Ill illiquidity lately. And I trade that way oftentimes too, but I sleep better at night knowing exactly what I'm risking. That's why I use some of these options. All right, so from, let me ask you real quick about the micros, if I could. 
The micro products have exploded in volume at the CME. Uh, can you just talk about uh, the advantage of micros in hedging versus the old ES and maybe if you feel like it versus the SPY? I don't use the SPY for that kind of thing, but just sort of a general comparison. Sure, I do kind of use the SPY um, for some things too, but the liquidity, particularly the liquidity overnight, is so much better than the CME products that I, I tend to use them more. And what I, my favorite part of the micros is this. Well, there's a couple different things. You know, they, but obviously the size of them can make them attractive for somebody who's who's trying out different markets than they normally trade, and you know you don't want to put on the same exposure as you might with the you know the mini contract is is like we call it a mini because of the contract. Right. So the mic I use them for is if I have an options position on that's beginning like in this. If we get to Thursday and Friday in this fly and it starts to move into the range I want it to, and I start making money. And the reason I said Thursday or Friday is because. These flies move a lot more when they're getting close to the expiration. I will use micros to try to lock in some of the profits. So to me, to to define your exposure is my new lease one. For someone who's a control freak like me, that's important. Right. Where can people find you if they need a little bit more explanation? And then I'm going to announce something if I could. It might be a little premature, but I'm going to do it anyway. Where can people find you on Twitter if they need to or whatever? At Jim Urio on Twitter, which is J-I-M-I-U-O-R-I-O. And if I'm busy, I'll just give you Bobby's cell phone number. <laughs> I don't think you have the actual one. I have like a burner phone that you have. So that, that's fine. I change it every week. So if you want to reach Jimmy on Twitter, uh, J-I-M-I-U-O-R-I-O, -I -I correct? Yeah, that's correct. It's at Jimmy Urio. Jimmy, thanks for being here. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but I want to tell you guys that are watching right now, that there is a high probability of a Jim Iorio show on this channel. So that'll be, it'll start with me and Jimmy, but Jimmy will have the opportunity to fire me if you would like, which I feel like he's probably going to do. Right away. Yeah, but we've got, we've got that opportunity. And, uh, you know, guys, give us comments. If you hated Jimmy, we won't do it. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to, yeah, I'm pretty sure we're going to do it. Everyone. Jimmy, again, I'm sorry. I wish I could have given you the whole time, but again. Right, I Technical difficulties. I'm going to go ahead and go to uh, my partner in Path Trading Partners, Mike Arnold, who's going to kind of help me wrap this show up. We're going to go a little bit long here because we started late, and I want to make sure I give you guys the full hour. But, uh, Mike, are you with me yet or no? Can you hear me, Bob? I can hear you. I can't. They can't see you, so don't worry about it. Mike doesn't like to be That's seen anyway. That they can't see me. Yeah, Mike doesn't like to be seen anyway. He's kind of like the, the guy behind the curtain of Path Trading Partners. So uh, let's talk about general markets, Mike. They're kind of breaking down a little bit now from where they were nearing toward the open. I've got the Dow down about 360, S&P down about 40, NASDAQ down about 71. So we're between three quarters of 1%, uh, maybe two thirds of 1% and one and a half percent uh, on the three major indices. So from a perspective of what's going on here, is this falling? And for the record, for people who are still with me, Mike's, um, Mike is price action. That's what he is. I'll sometimes say to Mike, what do you think of those earnings? And he'll be like, I don't care. Because he's very much about what the price is doing and what that does to his slash our trading. So from a perspective of what's going on right now with the live markets, what are you seeing? Right now, we're monitoring two key levels, uh, the 2820 to the upside and 2700. It just happens to be 2700. It wasn't that it was a round number. That's where it came in. So below 20, we're waiting for a break out above 2820 or a break down below 2700. Right now, we're in no man's land. If we go down below 2700, we have then a ton of support coming in about 26 60 to 26 uh 35 those are key support levels that will start targeting for short term short trades short term um, short trades short term short trades yes everything is short term right now it's, right it has to be we're not looking out more than a, a couple days at a time just based off what the, everybody else has talked about with this extreme volatility. You never know what's going to come out next. You don't know what's going to hit the news wire. And the markets can uh, turn around and, and rip your face off or plunge you in a matter of moments. So those are why we're – it's a little wider key levels than we normally do, but we let the price actually dictate it. Now, if we do get – us. A move above 2820, especially a little pop intraday above that and a retest of that level, then we will start watching for we have some significance 
a significant area, it happens to be, again, from price action 2900 not a round number, but then the next level, key level above that is 29.38.69, so 29.40 is, is the next key level above that. So it's interesting, your first level you mentioned, 28.20, is the first level of Jimmy's first call spread on the call, broken call fly. So if it breaks up above there, it sounds to me like his call fly would at least in the, in the short term be a good trade. That expires on Friday. Uh, you don't really do times of moves, right? I mean, you're not looking for a time frame in that necessarily. Well, if we break above 2820, I, I, the, the time frame for that move is, you know, two to three days, which would take it to the end of the week. And I do like on a move above that 2820 where his call fly is positioned because – Besides that 2,900 and 2,940 key levels, there is a lot of resistance. If you go back even to last year through the August, uh, August September timeframe and then back at the beginning of October, there was a lot of price action and a lot of – it was at that point very key support. And we talked about a concept – in trading, you know, support beginning resistance, resistance coming support. So, at, on any future rally above that twenty eight twenty level, it's rallying into a major prior support area, which we then will get as resistance. So, it can easily stall out there because there's many opportunities that people can say, "Okay, we've rallied back to this key resistance area. I'm going to take something off. I'm going to bank some profits if they're long. I'm going to even look to unwind some other positions." that I didn't unwind on the plunge. Yeah. So that's why uh, overhead, yes, we can have some quick rallies, but it's really rallying into a lot of overhead resistance. Hey, gas and diesel in the comments there. I can't really understand uh, what question you're asking. Do you mind rewording that? The way I read it on there is just read that kids aren't trending anything finance wise. They're trending, but eating instead. Uh, I'm not really sure what, you mean by that gas i'm i'm probably older than you so maybe you can reword that and we'll try and get an answer to you mike i like the idea of continuing the short side of crude oil and not participating in the long side of gold now for people who don't understand uh, mine and mike's relationship a lot of people don't understand i don't understand our relationship but understanding our relationship in the context of path trading partners and i've said this on other shows I will come up with a fundamental strategy for our clients. And prior to it going to the clients, Mike will uh, do the analysis from a price action perspective. And because we both believe that the least empowering question for a trader is why something is happening. And the most empowering question is what is happening. So in other words, what is happening? What are you doing about it? If I were to come to you today, Mike, and say, I want a short crude oil, even though it's down a lot. And... Um, I don't want to be involved in the long side of gold. What do you say to me? Crude oil, we have a lot of overhead resistance around 2650 uh, right now. So that's the key area. On any rallies, I wouldn't necessarily be shorting it right here, but on any rallies, going to be watching for short term sell signals, especially above 26. Around 26 to 2650 are the key areas. Now we could easily retest these lows, and if we do, if we do break down, we'll probably get a longer term major uh, buy divergence setup on one of the systems we follow. So I'm actually really keen to see it trade in the in the short term again on the short side down to and, and get below our most recent lows because that could set up a very powerful longer term buy signal. Uh, so again, any rallies are still shortable in crude at this point. In switching over to gold, gold we have a, we had a raise our stop signal back on the close on Friday on the futures. And we have our stop now below Friday's low at 1676.50. So on a closing basis below there is an exit to longs. And there's been a number of long trades that have triggered since mid-March. So it's now just managing those positions. Definitely not something, we have no short signal, nothing to 
do but manage the current long positions and then watch for that key level. I just said Friday's low, a close below that would be exit in the short term, watch for the bigger pullback, and then watch for a re-entry signal. We've got a pretty big um, watch list in our stock product, our stock portfolio. And um, I'm going to say something, Mike, if you don't mind pulling up what we already have and what we're looking at. In the meantime, I'm going to talk about something on the downside of equities in general. Because again, I've mentioned this in multiple conversations on TV and in speeches that I've given and talks that I've given. This is, it would be unprecedented to already have made the low after entering a bear market. Okay, entering bear markets, the time it takes to get to the low is generally much more than we've done. As a matter of fact, even in 1987, which was kind of a record pullout of the bear market, it still took us four months and 17 days to get back above that old bear market high. Whereas we made the low of the bear market in one day. So you can't really break that record, right? It's one day. And in theory, we've done it here as well. So the, the worst we can do is tie that record, although it wasn't actually exactly one day. But moving on from um, that whole perspective, I think there's going to be a new equity low. I do. I don't think the low is in. And I think it has a lot to do, from my perspective, that as Shri talked about early in the show, if you were here, the Fed can't do much about it. And the political, which I don't want to talk about, they can't get on the same page, uh, given this president and this Congress. And I'm not picking sides. Uh, you will never get me to pick sides on this show because we're about exposing you to the truth in trading and investing, not in politics. Someday we might have a show on this network that's political. This is not the one. So from a perspective of there being fiscal policy that makes sense, that doesn't harm the president or prove the president is correct, right, which would be both sides of that coin, the Fed can't do it all. And if they start buying equities, which I like what Jimmy said, they're buying corporate bonds anyway. So I'm not really sure what, uh, what the difference is between propping up corporations by buying their stock or buying their corporate bonds. I guess the corporate bonds are a little safer in the event of a collapse because the bondholders tend to get taken care of better than the stockholders. But from a perspective of how long it takes to reach a bear market low, I think this is more like 1987 than it is like 2002 and 2009. But I don't think we, we are at the low yet. So, Mike, in the stock think tank, which is our stock product, um, we have current positions and we have watch lists. Without giving details, can you tell people what we're long and what we're looking at getting long, but some of it might happen today. We're only long one stock uh, right now, which is uh, Cisco. Cisco. Right. So that's it. Everything else has been exited. Okay. We had a ton of major buy signals back uh, middle of March. So all those positions, like we were long Court, Intel, Prudential, Ameritrade, Sienna, Electronic Arts, Alexum Pharmaceuticals, SBB Financial, and all those have exited over the last few days. They all hit their price targets. We also did a special play on silver. We already talked about gold, but we did a special play on silver, which we exited on the 9th of April. So we're really down. We do have a small position in a long, this is a long-term play. Even if we talked about oil, we have a long-term play in USO. Uh, but that was bought on a major dip. So even if we go to new lows, that's a no risk because essentially oil got to go to zero before we're, we're hurting. Uh, <laughs> other than that, we're going to be watching. I, I do hope you're right with, and again, I, I trade the price action, so that's going to dictate stuff overall. But I do hope you're right with equities, and we do hit some more lows because on our watch list, I mean, we'd love to pick up some things like uh, Home Depot, American, American Express, Hershey's, uh, what else? Microsoft. We there's a number of these things that will be long term plays that we'll we'll look to if we if we drop rapidly leg into if we go down uh, slowly we'll probably just time the we'll do a position timing based off the systems but and maybe even Intel again which we've already traded once so. All these will be setting up for some longer term plays on very resilient companies that aren't that aren't going anywhere. Right. This is the time in my mind that you don't 
So you have a core portfolio and you have special plays and that core portfolio needs to be solid companies. And, you know, you have to think about the situation where you had Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers uh, in the financial crisis literally go to zero. You had General Motors go to zero. General Motors is back now, but they basically went to zero and then reissued, I, I guess we'll call it an IPO. So you got to be really careful about not trying to say, I really want to get long. The amount of texts, emails, Twitter messages that I got that said, Bobby, I want to buy stock. What should I buy here? Like, what should I buy on this day? You need to be in concrete stuff. I have a question from Good Looking Honky that sounds like a fake question, but no, I wouldn't sell beach for a property right now. If you can't, if you can let it go, that to me seems like you can hold it as well. We have no idea what the economy is going to look like. And I'm going to wrap the show up with this. Uh, also, by the way, I'm going to commit to an extra show on the end of this. We probably owe our sponsors, E-Trade and CME Group, another show. So if i got to fund it myself, I will. That's fine. We're going to add TAC an extra show on. We've got our show scheduled. So it looks to me like we'll go through our shows in September now. Um, from a perspective of the overall markets, don't get lulled by rallies. Mike and I have called these for years, rip your face off rallies that happen during bear markets. They're short covering rallies. Even if we get above the bear market price, from a perspective of somebody who looks at price action, you want to watch how it behaves above that price, not just if it gets above it. The financial news media recently was talking about all of how we, this is the shortest bear market ever because we already got above 20%. We got out of the bear market high. We'll see. If you've ever seen the movie Charlie Wilson's War, there's a great story in there about a Zen master and a little boy. Make sure you protect yourselves. Check out some of the smaller products at the CME. Check out the risk management that E-Trade gives you. And guys, I'm going to say goodbye now and tell you that you have just been exposed to technical difficulties from the Pure Exposure, Pure Exposure Group. You've been exposed to honest market uh, conversations. We had some really good guests. I wish I could have given them more time. I'm going to commit to getting all of these guests back on, maybe not by the May show, but within the next couple of shows. And we will let you guys know when that is. Cheers, everybody. Thanks for being here. Sorry about the technical problems. And please reach out with any questions you have. Bob underscore Iachino is my Twitter. The messaging function is wide open on my Twitter. You can reach me there. You guys can reach us at uh, pureexposuregrowseries.com. You can reach Mike and Pat, tradingpartners.com. Um, reach out. We'd love to hear from you guys. Cheers, everybody. Thanks to my guests for dealing with this. You've just been exposed.